Hey, Jerry. Oh, so everybody, maybe maybe you should all uh, mute yourself for now, and 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 maybe at the end we'll have a little time for question and answer, and you can unmute then. But until then, let's mute ourselves. Um, so uh, as I was saying, Joe Torrey is an associate professor of history at SUNY Brockport. Uh, his research specialty is early American economy and culture, and he has published a number of economic works on the American Enlightenment. Uh, Dr. Torrey has also directed numerous national endowment for the, for the humanities funded workshops on the 19th century reform movement in Rochester. Currently he's working on a book about a British American intellectual, Benjamin Vaughn. Of course I had to look up who Benjamin, Benjamin Vaughn is on Wikipedia. And uh, he's, uh, according to, to that site, he's the British political radical. He was a commissioner in the negotiation between Britain and the United States at the drafting of the Treaty of Paris. So you've already got me right there. When does the book come out? I'll, I'll well, get it's on gonna be a while yet for, for Amazon. <laughs> Benjamin Vaughn was actually also a really interesting. I mean, he was involved in the French Revolution and he ended up uh, going to Maine uh, because his mother's family was originally from Boston. Um, they were Hollowells, Hallowell, <laughs> and he ended up in Hollowell, Maine, and he ended up, um, oh, I'm, I'm really interested in his scientific ideas. He was actually a kind of a gentleman scientist. And so as he was planting his apple trees and, uh, and watching over his crops, he would uh, make all kinds of observations and, and keep voluminous correspondence and books and stuff. And all that stuff is at the American Philosophical Society, which is uh, America's oldest science library, essentially, in Philadelphia, where his brother lived. So it's a, it's a really interesting Anglo-American family, political radicals, um, educated by Quakers. There's all kinds of uh, stuff in there that, that, that and he hasn't had a, a, a serious biography of him or a recent biography of him, if at all, really, there was a book written maybe 50 years ago, and one of his relatives wrote a book about him. So I'm really it's excited about that project. And we got three more. Hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll carry that out uh, soon. So thank you for having me. And thanks to Zach for, for finding me out, seeking me out on, on, um, on the endless internet. And thank you for hosting me on this uh, Black History Month, because I think, uh, as you know, or as you might know, Douglas, uh, which I mean, is going to be the focus of what I have to say, today is one of the reasons that we have a Black History Month. Uh, it's, it's, it's in February, in part, in part because he was born in February, died in February, as well as Abraham Lincoln, and for other reasons, as, as I'll suggest. Um, as Zach mentioned, um, I, I, I'm not really a Douglas scholar. I'm, I'm, I started doing work on Douglas and, and ran these NEH workshops, which brought, uh, I think, something like 400 teachers from all over the country. The NEH funds these things. They give you big ball of money and you give it to teachers in the country to come and, and, and hang out in Rochester for a while to learn about the reform movement. And I started doing this because I really thought that nobody else was doing it. <laughs> it's by force of necessity. Um, you know, and, and I lived in Rochester, I'm just outside and I'm a 19th century American history, you know, historian. And so I feel I have a certain responsibility to speak to one of the greatest revolutionaries in the world history, really. <laughs> I mean, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass both lived in Rochester at the same time. They were both friends and they both tried to overturn the most fundamental structures of power in our society today, gender and race. <laughs> and so that's, that's a pretty mind blowing concept that in the middle of the 19th century, here they were in this kind of, you know, boom town, but really a small place, 30,000 people, not a Baltimore or New York, Boston, Philadelphia, nothing like that. And they were trying to overturn what was an international system of domination. So, I mean, I, I really think it's just a, a mind-blowing story. And so I started uh, trying to uphold my historical responsibility to, to, the, to, that, to that narrative and, and began these NEH workshops along with some colleagues, Rich Newman and others from RIT and have um, gone on to do a bunch of other stuff. Um, so I wanted to, <clears throat> I'm gonna put up a PowerPoint if you don't mind. 
And so you'll, um, I think my talking head will still be there. You guys will, most of you guys will disappear for a little while. Um, you know, uh, Zach, there's also a closed captioning on this. If somebody, um, I, I use closed captioning in my classes because uh, just for gr greater accessibility, but if you don't, you guys don't use it, don't use it. It's up entirely, it's entirely your call. <laughs> Where is that located? Um, <laughs> I think you have to, Share screen, record. Let me see now. I, I, I don't have that all the controls you have. Right. And so, I mean, if it's fine with, with you, maybe under audio settings. I did, I started using it um, in my one of my classes because I actually have a, a student who's 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 fully deaf and and she's a wonderful teacher and student and um we had to figure out how to make it all work and we did but if it doesn't work if it doesn't matter to you i just thought of it as an afterthought on my part i apologize i didn't mean to interrupt let me put up the powerpoint and get that going and um and we can start to talk about frederick Douglass and and some of the broader oh you got to enable share screening on my part yeah we'll do I'm the co-host now, okay. And here we go. So I'm gonna put up this PowerPoint and dismiss my, oh, we'll go back to the beginning. <clears throat> so this is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is um, uh, Frederick Douglass in 1847 at the time that he moved into Rochester. And I'll come back and talk about his physical stature and his presence and his you know, charismatic physicality, if you will, momentarily. Uh, Douglas was often referred to as the most photographed man in the 19th century. And that wasn't by accident. He, I think he understood very well the power of photography. And he understood uh, how the minstrel shows, for example, as representations, popular representations of African Americans were were you know, had diminished their dignity and their and their and their humanity, and so in all of these photographs, you see that he's always very you know, he's got a very focused look. <laughs> he's not he's not you know he wants to be as taken as a serious serious person, which of course he was. He was a very serious intellectual, uh, a great uh, courageous uh, abolitionist. A charismatic speaker uh, uh, and a tremendously powerful, powerful person, and and he doesn't want to come off as a as a joker and and somebody who's going to be diminished. And so his portraits are amazing because um, he understood the power of photography. He understood that he needed to represent the African American people, <laughs> slave enslaved and free. And so he took this very seriously, and he he posed for hundreds of photographs. Um, all of which represent a, 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 a counter narrative to the to the popular representations of African Americans of the time, and this is 1847 when he would have moved to Rochester. Zach mentioned that um, <clears throat> he found me through this project online. This is a project that was started by my colleague Carvin Eason, who's a communications professor at at the College of Brockport at SUNY Brockport. And Carvin is a documentary filmmaker and actually made a really excellent film about the, uh, um, the uh, protest in July of 1964 in Rochester, New York, which were uh, part of that whole sweep of 1960s uh, protests in, in, in urban centers in all across the country from LA to Chicago, Detroit, uh, New York City, Rochester, and, and so on. And so Carvin uh, decided that for the 2018 uh, celebration of, of, of Douglas's birth, he would um, engage in this broader project to create a, a walking tour of Douglas's experience in Rochester um, and, and to celebrate <clears throat> his statue. So if you go to douglastour.com, you can find uh, a map and you click on that map and you will get narratives that I wrote. <laughs> uh, and you can actually click on a little button and it will read it. it. You know, you can read it if you like. It's, a, you know, they're approximately four or 500 words or 300 words per site. Or you can have, have an audio tour, if you will, virtual audio tour 
uh, that somebody else reads. And this is another, you know, I mean, I, increasingly at Brockport, we're focusing on what's called public facing history. And that, you know, the way most people consume history in the world, <laughs> in America, is not through academic classrooms and it's not through uh, academic books it's through these experiences so hopefully we're trying to have a broader footprint in that in that world and and hopefully you'll find this to be a a, a meaningful experience uh, for you and 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 your friends and one of the parts of the project is we they've taken the Douglas statue which I'll show you momentarily which was theoretically the first statue raised to an African American specific African American person in the United States and they made a replica of it, or replicas, I think there's 13 of them, and they um, <coughs> put them all over the city in various places where Douglas had an impact. And so this one's at Mount Hope Cemetery, where Douglas uh, was, is buried with his family, uh, his wife and, and, and daughter, or so there are two, two of his wives, he was married twice. Uh, and um, <clears throat> And... If you have a, a phone with a QR code reader, you can just walk up and sweep it and up will come the tour with the voices and the reading and all that stuff. It's, it's a very nice project, but it's had a tremendous impact um, locally. Here's his grave site, which is at Mount Hope Cemetery. And I used to take students to all the time. And so I wrote these narratives and these can be read to you if you like. And on the right hand side here, you'll see all the different places that he was an influential part of Rochester's life you will so um <laughs> uh, uh you know an excellent tour zach uh, found me that way but hopefully hopefully you guys uh, will have some time to do that and if, zach if you like i can send you a bunch of other stuff that's available you know locally like rochester has a number of walking tours that you can sort of take online and, and do things like that so if you guys can't um you know get get out and do museum tours maybe you can do some of these virtually <clears throat> I, would, I would like that. And then I'd also like uh, to look at stuff for post COVID when we're allowed to go back out uh, <laughs> because we'll be wanting to come to Rochester and there's a lot of interesting things to do up there. So maybe you can oh, guide you us know, there. A, a fabulous history, not only Susan B. Anthony house, which of course was where she you know lived Well, theoretically lived. She was on the road a lot. <laughs> But you know, she and her sister uh, lived there, and 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 really, it's it's a revolutionary place. I mean, I, I what I try and emphasize with my students is it's as revolutionary a place as Philadelphia was. If what, what Philadelphia was to the American Revolution, Rochester was to the American Revolution reform movement, <laughs> to the revolution of the reform movement. Okay, so it's 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 uh, and here's the statue itself, which was raised in 1899. And um, used to sit downtown, um, <laughs> but um, but now sits um, in Highland Park. It used to be by the Highland Bowl, and they've moved it once again because um, they wanted to make it a more central part of the city's life. And again, it's 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 one of the few statues. It's, one, it's the first statue specifically dedicated to an individual, an African American individual. There were statues raised. Uh, during the Civil War and the post-Civil War period to African-American soldiers, for example, uh, but they were not the specific personalities that had created, affected change, at least in theory. One of my colleagues, Rich Newman, pointed out to me many years ago that, in fact, the Richard Allen, uh, <clears throat> who founded the American Methodist Episcopal Church, the AM&E, in Philadelphia, um, 1794, he made the first church. And in 1816, he was ordained the bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Actually had a monument created for him <clears throat> in 1876, which was gonna be, um, it was going to be in the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition, 1876 to 1876. However, the monument, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I have uh, allergies in my, throat tickles. I will continuously do that. I apologize for that. Um, the monument ha was involved in a train wreck. <laughs> and so um, to this day, oh, somebody's waiting to get in, yeah, admitting them. <laughs> okay. The monument uh, was involved in a train wreck and was lost. Um, and the only thing that survived from it is the, the, the bust. And this was actually um, 
at Wilberforce College, which is a historically African American college, a historically black college, and I think it's in Tennessee. I'm not sure. Maybe I know there's a Wilberforce in Ohio, but um, and any at any rate, this actually was sitting in their library, and nobody knew how old it was or what it was from. They knew it was Richard Allen, <laughs> but. <laughs> At some point, somebody said, hey, I think that's the bust of Richard Allen that went missing when the train crashed. And maybe we should get it back to Philadelphia where it was going to in the first place. And, and, and they, it's actually back in Philadelphia as of summer of 2020, it's been brought back to Philadelphia. But this is actually the first monument, not necessarily Douglas's statue. And another interesting story, you know, we, we attribute the birth year of Douglas, excuse me, the birth date, that's February 14th, because um, the legend is that his mother used to refer to him as a her Valentine, Valentine baby. But in fact, what, what my colleague uh, Rich Newman has suggested is that he was probably given that birth date because that was Richard Allen's birth date. And Richard Allen's date of birth was already being celebrated in the first decades of the 19th century by African American, the African American community as a kind of celebration day. Um, and, and so it's quite likely possible that he was simply, that they didn't know when he was born precisely. They actually had the wrong year on his tombstone at Mount Hope in one of them. It's in 1819 and then there's a second tombstone there that's 1818 because they simply didn't know until they dug up some, some records at the plantation in Maryland where he was born. Um, <clears throat> but uh, essentially, uh, you know, we think he was given that birthday because of Richard Allen, who was who was already being celebrated as a person, as an African American figure of a uh, significant member of the community for founding the AME um, uh, Church uh, in the first decades of the 19th century. So this is the actual statue of Frederick Douglass as it was originally positioned. It was created by Sidney Edwards in 1899. Douglass, as I'll mention again, passed away in 1895. And immediately there was a call to create a statue for him in his home city of Rochester, where he lived for more than 25 years. And um, what I'm going to do in my in my in my remaining time is speak to Douglas's life and how he became the powerful abolitionist that he did. But also, I want to kind of lay down a slightly broader framework and talk about some of the community, the African American and white community, that was also part of his abolitionist. Um, movement, because I think that Douglas, who was, of course, a writer and abolitionist and born into the age of the romantic hero of American society, <laughs> always positioned himself rightly as, as a romantic hero of abolition. And he wrote books that way, and he wrote fiction that emphasized the, and, you know, this was a common narrative, for example, in, 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 in the fiction of the era, the romantic hero, but he at the same time relied on a very, very broad community that we sometimes forget uh, in terms of in terms of their efforts. Um, so <laughs> Douglas, as I mentioned, was born in 1818. He was born into uh, into slavery in, in Maryland. Um, um, his mother had passed away when he was seven years old. And, it, and he never really knew her uh, to any extent because I mean, she would he, he knew her in the sense that she would visit. Uh, he was raised by his grandmother, largely by his grandmother and his grandmother's home. Uh, eventually, when he was uh, eight years old, he was sent off to live uh, with his master or owner's brother, Hugh and Sophia Ald. So he's, he's, he was literally owned by Thomas Ald, who owned the big plantation down in Baltimore. And he's he's born into the into the into the um, uh, old plantation. He he remains as a child living with his grandmother. His mother passes away, and when he's eight years old, he's sent to live in Baltimore. And this is kind of fortuitous for him because what it means is that he's going to be raised in an urban setting, and he's raised by the Hugh and Sophia Ald, who are largely sympathetic. They're not hard taskmasters in terms of they want him to be. He's kind of charged with being the companion to their child, but he has a certain amount of freedom um, being raised in Baltimore as a child. And <clears throat> urban enslaved African Americans overall had a greater level of personal freedom in that they would often be subcontracted out as skilled, as skilled workers. And so they could actually 
in some cases, they would subcontract themselves out and pay a kind of rent to their owners, if you will. <laughs> what that meant was that they, they had a certain amount of personal freedom. And so with cultures in cities like Baltimore of free African American or free and enslaved African Americans were very different than they would have been on the plantation. So he's exposed to this kind of more liberating uh, environment. Uh, eventually he's, uh, and he learns to read and write there. Um, uh, Sophia Ald is not supposed to teach him how to read, but she teaches him how to read and he quickly takes to it. And, you know, there's, there's a very good literature on, on you know, how uh, Hugh Ald said to her, you know, you, you will make him unfit to be a slave by teaching him how to read. And apparently Douglas heard that and, and said, wow, here's the, here's the trick. <laughs> I'm going to read everything I can. And I'm going to write everything I can. I'm going to teach others how to read. And I'm going to do all that stuff because reading makes you unfit to be a slave. And if there's anything I want to be is unfit to be a slave. So, <clears throat> so he actually, um, you know, he, he, he credited his education to something called the Columbia Orator, which was a kind of popular textbook of the age. And in an age of oration, <laughs> people educated themselves by reading speeches and by, you know, and the Columbia Raider is full of speeches and, 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 you know, popular works. And it's a kind of compendium of information and knowledge and stuff that he would have been, um, that he would have, that he would have been exposed to. He owned his own copy and he read and he learned how to read on it. He taught others how to read on it. He's eventually taken back to the plantation when he's 15, 16 years old in 1834 um, and he does experience the brutality of the of the typical slave plantation. He's beaten by Edward Covey, who is a sub subcontractor who hires him from his um, <clears throat> his owner. Um, eventually, he's sent back to Baltimore, where he becomes a skilled worker. He becomes a ship cocker. Uh, ship cockers are the people who you, who would tighten the ship up, who would put in the the pine tar and stuff to make it a tight watertight <laughs> vessel, which is very important. And there was a kind of skilled uh, laborer on the Baltimore shipyards. Uh, and then he meets Anna Murray in 1836. He's 18 years old. And she helps them to escape. And she's a free African-American woman living in Baltimore. Baltimore is a significant uh, free population um, uh, and he escapes, he, he, he grabs, um, he gets some papers, some, some, some passage papers from a free African-American um, sailor, and he puts on a sailor's outfit, gets on a train, ends up uh, <clears throat> in New York City. Anna joins him in New York City. They're eventually married, with, and then they move to Massachusetts, uh, New Bedford and Lynn, Massachusetts. And in New Bedford, is where he really begins to take off as a as a abolitionist and as an orator. Oh, <clears throat> Joanne is trying to get in, Zach. <laughs> he takes off as a as an orator and as as a as a, as an intellectual, and it, it's in part because he joins the AM&E Zion Church. So there's the AM&E, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is founded by Richard Allen. And then there's the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, which is founded in New York City. I think it's around 1826 or so. It's founded after the, the Allen Church, so it's not the first. And um, in, in, in New Bedford, Massachusetts, the minister there is Thomas James, who is a former Rochester resident and who was an enslaved African-American. I'll come back to him and talk about him shortly. Uh, was enslaved in Kanajahori, New York, uh, and uh, freed himself and went to Canada and then went to Rochester, worked on the Erie Canal, taught himself how to read and write, became a minister. <laughs> he did it all. Like a, another fantastic story from a guy that you never kn really know anything about. I had a student do a project on him, and I, I, it was just a tremendous, tremendous um, revelation, Thomas James. And Thomas James, the first per he, he's the guy who encourages Douglas he ordains Douglas as an actual minister in the AM and E Zion Church. And Douglas begins to um, <clears throat> go to abolitionist meetings in New Bedford. New Bedford is a, a very significant center for abolition in the 19th century. Garrison and William Lloyd Garrison of the American Anti Slavery Society, and numerous other speakers would have gone to New Bedford all the time. And 
eventually he gets recognized. You know, somebody he starts speaking and somebody says, wow, that guy can really, uh, you know, he's a powerful speaker. He's charismatic. He's handsome. He's super smart. <laughs> and they, they sign him up. And the way that abolition worked at this time is they would sign you up as a speaker on a tour. And so he starts talking for the, he starts uh, touring with the Western, with the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And then he gets signed up by the American Anti-Slavery Society, which is the first national organization dedicated to abolition. It's run by William Lloyd Garrison, a famous abolitionist you might uh, know. And, and he really begins to tour with a group of other abolitionists all over the country, including Rochester, where they come in, they do these talks, you know, and in an age where there's no television, no internet, no Zoom, no radio, no national newspapers, this is the way information was disseminated, you know? <clears throat> Eventually you're gonna have the telegraph uh, becoming an important information network. But um, those of you down in Cornell know a little bit about that, I, I suspect, uh, but you know, um, uh, the the there's no real other you know way to get information out and so they literally physically tour around <laughs> and they go to place to place and before you know it Douglas is really a very very important um person you guys can still see my screen changing now right because okay that's great so this you know in 1845 he publishes his first book narrative of the life of frederick Douglass written by himself. And this becomes a massive bestseller. <laughs> and it becomes a best bestseller and it's translated into different languages. It's sold all over Europe. Uh, it's translated into French, into, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it sells extremely well in its original language in the UK, in Britain, uh, Ireland, um, England. Uh, and he begins immediately a tour as well of of the uk he's gone for something like um 18 months he leaves for the uk and he, he tours all around britain uh raising money for the anti-slavery cause um and raising money for himself to become uh, uh, uh his own his own abolitionist project if you will okay because what's what's happening with the american anti-slavery society is that when they tour he's increasingly becoming the main guy <laughs> and he's actually getting a little bit of jealousy from the other, the other folks. And he's starting to demand a little bit more autonomy and they wanted to go up there and talk about his experience as a slave. And he says, yeah, okay, I, I can do that. But I, I also want to talk about why slavery is an abomination because of natural rights law. He's a real intellectual. I want to talk about why it's unnatural. I want to talk about why, you know, he wants to talk about the broader, and so he's just increasingly chafing under their control, if you will, and under their tutelage. And so when he goes to, to, the, to Britain on this 18 month tour, he becomes a, a superstar really. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, he's mobbed in Britain and, he, and they give him a bunch of money before he leaves and they say, here, go found your own newspaper. And when he comes back, he does so. And he, he moves to Rochester, New York in 1847 and he founds the North Star. And that's really a separation from Garrison and the American Anti-Slavery Society. It's a philosophical separation. It's a separation of, yeah, I need to be my own person because you guys are holding me down. Thank you for the, for the opportunity, but it's time to, to break away. And it's a movement into a different wing of the abolition movement, okay? And I'll, I'll come back to that momentarily. But, you know, he becomes a... Here's a, a, a sheet music, <laughs> the fugitive song uh, uh, published in 1845, the year that he published his famous book. And there's a depiction of, of um, um, Douglas um, on, the, on the actual sheet music itself. It's written about him. And, you know, it would have been, these would have been sung at abolitionist meetings. Uh, abolitionists, a lot of them were very religious, as you might know. Of course, the church is a fundamental part of the entire abolition movement. And singing was a fundamental part of many of the, many of the churches of this era, the Methodist church and Baptist churches and, and others use music as, um, you know, and, and so they would have been singing this. Um, <clears throat> and he becomes really a, a significant person. This is a um, a, a work of fiction that Douglas wrote. It's called The Heroic Slave. <laughs> and he published that in 1852. And his 
editor, Julia Griffiths, who was a European woman, she and her sister came to live in Rochester and work with Douglas because they thought, wow, this guy's just, you know, he's really the most powerful abolitionist in the world. <laughs> and so he come, they come to Rochester to, to, they live at the house for a while, she and her sister, and, and they, and they um, <clears throat> help him with his publications and running the newspaper. And they, they publish this Autographs for Freedom as a kind of compendium of stories which includes the heroic slave, which is a story about uh, mutiny on a slave ship and redemption for white people, white slave owners. Uh, it's it's a kind of in the in the vein of numerous other. So he's writing fiction. He's the subject of sheet music. <clears throat> he writes a second biography in 1855, uh, autobiography. Excuse me, my my bondage, my freedom, which includes this photograph, which is a very famous photograph because it it shows his hands. <clears throat> and sometimes his hands are cropped out of the picture because his hands are clenched his fists. <laughs> he, he can be a street fighting guy too once in a while. You know, these guys would get mobbed. Uh, they'd be in Indiana. I think it was in Indiana. They were attacked by a mob that beat them physically. And he had his hand broken in that assault, um, which he never, he never healed correctly. Uh, in New York City, he was walking down the street with Julia Griffiths and her sister, and they, he was beaten by a, a mob of thugs, toughs, uh, you know, Bowery boys that didn't like the fact that he was walking down the street with, with white women. Uh, and so they beat him severely. And so he often had occasion to fight back. Uh, and, and so this photograph, sometimes it gets cropped because the hands are a little bit controversial. Um, which we can discuss afterwards if you like. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, the front cover for my bondage, my freedom. And I've highlighted here, you know, this is a quote that is included underneath the, the introduction by James McCune Smith. And this is a quote from Samuel Taylor Coleridge that 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 Douglas would have chosen for this for this book, right? By a principle essential to Christianity, a person is eternally differenced from a thing. So that the idea of a human being necessarily excludes the idea of property in that being. And of Coleridge, as you might know, was a famous uh, British romantic and poet and intellectual. He wrote all kinds of books about, you know, the way we think, how, how our brains work and romanticism. And, and, you know, this is how we need to think about Douglas, I think. He's not just a, a guy who was formerly enslaved and, and you know, was a a powerful orator. He was also a powerful intellectual, and he really engaged with the, the foremost thinkers of his time. And you know, I had a student to do a, a, a thesis on, on on Douglas's natural rights theories that he developed in his own writing. And even when he wasn't trying to be an intellectual, even when he was giving a speech, for example, the rhetorical construction of the speech, if you do an analysis of it, his famous what to the slave is what to what what is what to the slave is July the fourth or something which he gave in Rochester at Corinthian Hall. The rhetorical construction of it is extremely sophisticated. He, you know, critiques. He warms himself, uh, encourages, is generous to the audience, brings them. You know, he's manipulating what they're hearing by way of educating. <laughs> it's really pedagogical. Uh, it's really transformative. Um, so 1855, he publishes the second or second bi autobiography, 1881, yet another autobiography, which is kind of, um, you know, his, his, it's his life story uh, from the beginning to the end, the end being when he served um, uh, in Washington, D.C. in various positions given to him by, by various presidents, Rutherford B. Hayes, Garfield, others. Um, uh, and he was a uh, minister to Haiti, for example. He was on the Santo Domingo Commission or something like that. He was involved in, um, he was a sheriff uh, for a little while for the for DC, District of Columbia, which was then controlled by the, by the executive. And so he had a very, very, this is his final testament, if you will. He dies not long after this, or maybe a decade after this, excuse me. It's, I guess that's long enough. <laughs> and, and, you know, throughout his life, he published three newspapers, uh, Frederick Douglass paper, uh, North Star, all of these in Rochester. He also tried to publish a newspaper in Washington, D.C. He moved to D.C. 
after his house burnt down in Rochester, I think it was 1872, it was a suspected arson. And, the, and, and he finally said, well, I've got nothing left in Rochester. And he moved to Washington, D.C., where his, um, his, where his historical home is now. It's the only surviving home that we have of him, other, other than the property that he owned in Rochester, which is still there. Uh, but he never lived there. It was a, 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 an investment property, maintained his, his ability to vote, we think. He, he had an extra house in Rochester, so he could always vote in, in elections. But uh, he published the North Star, the Frederick Douglass paper, and the Douglass Monthly, all of them um, <coughs> in Rochester. This is the, the, the North Star. And you can see here, um, I'm going to read my, I, my own screen is blocked out a little bit. Uh, right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is the father of us all. And we are all brethren is on the, the, on the, on the, 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 the mast, masthead of the, of the North Star newspaper. And of course, as you might know, he was involved in uh, women's rights. He was at Seneca Falls in 1848. He actually published the proceedings of the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in the North Star newspaper. It was the, North, it was the newspaper of record for that convention. So he was tremendously involved in his community. Now, I mentioned earlier, you know, that I want to also um, <laughs> speak to the broader community. And um, William Lloyd Garrison was a, a very famous abolitionist. Um, uh, you know, he's sort of, if you look at the your typical textbook, he's the guy that comes up. <laughs> Abolition section, William Lloyd Garrison, and he published The Liberator and he established the American Anti-Slavery Society. But William Lloyd Garrison is the guy who brings Douglas into the abolitionist fold. And, but his, his abolitionism is based on the idea that uh, slavery is a sin. It's moral evil. And the only way you can undo a sin is through moral suasion. And Garrison would, would literally rip up copies of the Constitution. He'd let it on fire and he'd say, this is a deal with the devil. He, he, he talked about the North seceding from the South. And he said, you know, it'd be better off if we seceded from the United States and became the North with no slavery, which <laughs> for many enslaved peoples was lunacy because basically you're abandoning us to these <laughs> to these people that are going to destroy our destroy our communities and our lives and our, our you know and so uh, Garrison's immediatism was really powerful and many many people continue to 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 follow Garrison's idea that the only way to end slavery is 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 through moral suasion and moral teaching not through politics um, but people like uh, 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 Douglas, eventually he broke away from that and, and he broke away for that. Um, another person who was involved in the Rochester movement was Charles Finney, who of course was a Presbyterian minister and was um, credited with uh, igniting the Second Great Awakening in Rochester in 1830. He came to Rochester and did a series of revivals in the Third Presbyterian Church. And that really set off a wave. And what it also did for abolition is it ignited this concept of immediatism. If, if slavery is a moral sin, you know, New York undid slavery with what's called gradualism, right? They, they established a law, and after 1831, slavery was kaput, no more slaves at all. But before that, if you were born at a certain point, you know, there was a kind of gradualist. What these guys are saying is slavery is morally repugnant to God. It is a sin. It is a deal with Satan. <laughs> so we can't do anything gradual about that we've got to just break away from that and so finney was another famous rochester person well he's from utica but he ended up preaching in rochester and, and then moved on to other places but in in what's called the burnt over region western new york as, as many of you will likely know from ithaca um, you know there was a huge abolitionist movement people like briar green who were founders of the Oneida Institute, which is a, a, one of the first universities or colleges in the United States to accept African-American and white students at the same time. And Beriah Green was one of the Lane rebels, as it's called, Lane Seminary was a theological seminary established to produce ministers who would go on and preach abolition, essentially. Uh, it's part of an entire, entire movement. So, so he comes to Rochester Douglas in 1847, and I'm suggesting that he's breaking away from the, the Garrisonians, and he's going to make, make his, own, his own, become his own person, if you will. 
and he moves to Rochester. <laughs> Rochester was at the center of a different style of abolitionism led by people who were interested in using politics to end slavery. <laughs> and it seems rudimentary to us now, right? You say, well, of course, you want to affect social change policy. Laws are a good way to do it. Uh, but a lot of abolitionists simply rejected that, that strand of thinking. It was a deep divide in the abolitionist movement. And in Rochester, you had uh, free African-Americans uh, prior to, Roch to, to Douglas coming who were involved in the political movement and in, in, in Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and into the Ohio Valley, you had uh, what was called the Colored Men's Association Movement. And these were free African-American men who would meet every year in a different city and they would advocate for abolition and strategize as to how to how to how to create a, how to end slavery, how to destroy slavery, and and Douglas increasingly becomes involved with that movement, and with various other folks. Um, Rochester is also where Thomas James was from. I mentioned earlier uh, he was born into slavery in New York State, Canajoharie, New York. He frees himself, goes to Canada, comes back, works on the railroad, teaches himself, how to, excuse me, on the canal, works in a warehouse on the canal at Child's Basin right downtown Rochester, teaches himself how to read and write, becomes an AM&E Zion minister, is actually critical to the founding of the AM&E Zion. He, he actually, this is, this is what's called the African church. It's the AM&E Zion church in Rochester, New York. The actual footprint for this is still exists it's on friend street in downtown rochester the building has burnt down a few times on top <laughs> as as is the way with 19th century buildings but they've redone it and this is where actually douglas when he moves to rochester in 1847 goes to the AME zion he begins to publish his newspaper in the basement of the AME zion uh, and it's still a congregation in Rochester, New York, called the AME Zion. And they've taken the stained glass from this building and put it in their new building. And the stained glass features um, uh, the, like the likenesses of Susan B. Anthony, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a reform church. It's a reform ideal church. But also, you know, Rochester included people like Austin Stewart who was also born into slavery in Virginia, um, uh, was brought to New York as a child, freed himself, uh, um, became a businessman in New York. He actually started working for a guy named Comstock, who was a farmer, learned how to be a butcher, became a butcher, made a bunch of money, uh, bought some houses. Um, he was actually one of the founders of what was called the Wilberforce Colony in London, Ontario. Uh, in, in 1829, there were a number of riots in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and, and the riots were white supremacist riots against free African-Americans in the community. And so a bunch of African-Americans from Ohio fled. And he was one of the folks that took them and established this community in near London, Ontario, that survived for about 30 years. Um, but Austin Stewart was also part of the Rochester community and also part of the the network that Douglas would have would have would have come to have been at the center of okay let's put it that way because he's he's a national figure but he's coming into this broader community and there were others Martin Delaney uh, didn't live in Rochester very long but he was um, uh, born into slavery eventually um, uh, self freed his family they 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 freed themselves he's lived in Pittsburgh he was a journalist in Pittsburgh he was actually the first African American officer in the Union Army, was admitted to the Harvard Medical School at one point, but couldn't, couldn't actually take classes there because the, the students uh, rioted <laughs> to remove uh, uh, African-American students who had been admitted to the Harvard Medical School. They protested, and so he was kicked out. But he, was, uh, he had practiced medicine in Philadelphia and um, went to work with Rod in Rochester with Douglas on the newspaper when he arrived. Henry Highland Garnett, um, uh, who was a New York City formerly enslaved, uh, 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 big, big pusher for a political abolition solution to, you know, let's not ask anymore for them to free us because it's a sin. Let's just take political power and make this thing happen, <laughs> which is a kind of vision that eventually Douglas comes to embrace. And they had a, a number of personality conflicts, but Henry Allen Garnett is another person who's an important part of this community of abolitionists uh, living in the greater New York state area. 
Jermaine Wesley Logan, who lives in Syracuse and is part of the Underground Railroad, writes his own biography um, and, and, and is, is a minister. He na his name Wesley, of course, is, is after John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. He gave himself that name. He's also a name in he's Zion Bishop. Um, and he's involved in this famous um, Jerry's Rescue that you may know if you're from Syracuse, you know that there's a statue downtown Syracuse dedicated to, after the Compromise of 1850 when you had the Fugitive Slave Act, there were increasingly huge conflicts in northern cities when fugitive slave catchers would come and try and take a fugitive enslaved person away. <laughs> And Jermaine Logan and many others in Syracuse literally physically fought the slave catchers and freed uh, the man whose nickname was Jerry. Um, but but uh, uh, but you know he so he's part of this prominent community of people that I want to emphasize. Harriet Tubman, who is uh, eventually ends up in Auburn, New York. Harry Tubman, of course, was a great conductor on the Underground Railroad and led many many African American families to freedom from the South. She was also a Union Army spy. And in the papers at the University of Rochester, there's a, there's a quartermaster's pay slip uh, for Harriet Tubman in the Union Army for her espionage. She would be behind the lines and she'd be, and she led, she was one of the few, well, probably the only African-American woman that physically led by, she, you know, she navigated, um, um, a contingent of, 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 of Union Army soldiers through the South at one point into a famous attack to free 700 uh, enslaved African Americans. And also Harriet Jacobs, who lived in Rochester. Um, and she, of course, in 1861, she wrote a uh, narrative in the life of a slave girl, I think. I think it was the title of the book. A very famous uh, book published in 1861 late in the era, but before that, she had lived in Rochester and had actually operated an anti-slavery reading room in what is called the Tallman Building. And the Tallman Building is where eventually Douglas goes to publish the North Star. He sets up offices there and he publishes the North Star and all the other newspapers there. And Jacobs and her brother live with um, <clears throat> Amy Kirby Post, who some of you guys might know about a little bit. She's um, She's a Quaker, Hicksite Quaker abolitionist, a famous family in Rochester. She had, she was the founder of the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society, which was the first biracial, um, by gender, like non, non, non men, non women, not white, non black uh, society, based out of their family. And Harriet Jacobs lived in Rochester with um, Amy Kirby Post and her husband for a long time. They would actually host like a dozen people at a time in their house. And he was a, a Quaker businessman dedicated to, to abolition and numerous other reforms. So the, the big idea is, you know, Douglas, it's incredible, powerful, intellectual speaker, courageous, charismatic, you know, central to the overturning of, of racist ideas. He was, I, I tell my students, he was a walking anti-racism campaign. <laughs> Because everywhere he went, part of the, you know, part of the, the whole business for slavery it was predicated on the perceived racial inferiority of African Americans. People said, oh, slavery is good because, you know, black people are inferior and therefore we need to. So here comes Frederick Douglass, who is the, easily the smartest man in the room anywhere he goes. <laughs> and, and it's like a corrosive acid to that logic, right? But he also had help from people like Garrett Smith who was a famous abolitionist in Peterborough, New York, a very wealthy man. His father was involved with John Jacob Astor with the fur trading business, and he had hundreds of thousands of acres. He had, at one point established a colony of free, uh, formerly enslaved African-Americans in uh, North Elba, North Elba. It's northern, upstate New York, but, but up towards Vermont. And, and um, uh, he gave away land. He, he, here's 100 acres. Here's what, and he, he, he took John Brown. John Brown was the only white man living in that colony. John Brown was possibly the only white man who didn't have a racist idea in his head, presumably. And he was living in that, in that, in that colony with them. But he was very influential. And he supported Frederick Douglass for a long time. He had an underground railroad station in his, in, his, in his home. And, you know, he was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's cousin. He was involved in all of these different organizations, right, and groups, women's rights, 
abolition. And John Brown himself lived with Frederick Douglass in Rochester for a little while and planned his famous attack on Harper's Ferry in conjunction with Douglas and Douglas met him the night before they went and attacked Harper's Ferry. Douglas was down in, 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 in Virginia and they met at a quarry. Douglas said, you're, you're crazy. You shouldn't be doing this. This is a really bad idea. You're all going to die. Uh, and Douglas, and it's quite clear that Brown possibly knew that, but you know, um, Douglas entertained the idea that maybe we need violence to end slavery. He started out with moral suasion, said, let's go to political action. <laughs> But at some point he starts thinking, wow, you know, he, he rejected John Brown's violent efforts, but he was sympathetic to Brown. And he, he actually fled the country after Brown was, was, was arrested, as, as, did, as did Garrett Smith. Garrett Smith was implicated, one of the, he's, he was one of the secret six who actually funded John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. They needed guns, they needed food, all that stuff. They, somebody had to give them money and there were six so the secret six funded that stuff. Um, and so, you know, Douglas was part of this broader community of abolitionists, which was tremendously powerful. And I know this is a very long quote. Maybe we don't have time to read it because I've sort of gone over time. I, although I can stick around, there's, there's no, no reason for me to go anywhere. If you guys have time, I'm glad to, to, to answer questions. Time is open. Oh, wonderful. Rush. You know, and what I think, you know, I keep thinking, I keep saying that, and it's, he's, intellectually engaged with the zeitgeist of his time. He's a romantic. You know, what he says here is through the broad vision of a true philosophy, nothing in this world stands alone. Everything is a necessary part of everything else. The margin of chance is narrowed by every extension of reason and knowledge, and nothing comes unbidden to the feast of human experience. It's a providential vision, right? The universe of which we are a part is continually proving itself a stupendous whole, a system of law and order, eternal and perfect. Every seed bears fruit after its kind, and nothing is reaped which was not sowed. The distance between seed time and harvest in the moral world, in the moral world, may not be quite so well defined or as clearly intelligible as in the physical, but there is a seed time and there is a harvest time. And though ages may intervene, and neither he who plowed nor he who sowed may reap in person, yet the harvest nevertheless will surely come. And as in the physical world, there are century plants, so it may be in the moral world, and their fruitage is as certain in the one as in the other. And he'd, he'd come to understand, you know, uh, abolition as part of this natural law. It's like a physical law, right? Slavery is unnatural. <laughs> and so there's no way it can survive. And, and so he, in, in his speeches and in other things, he continuously emphasizes this concept uh, towards the end of his life, especially, that's really based in Scottish moral philosophy. It's based on, you know, the works of Coleridge. It's based on romantic epistemology. Uh, it's based on this broader intellectual culture, which he positions himself at the center, and which I think is his rightful place, in addition to his incredibly courageous efforts to, to end abolition and his incredibly powerful speeches and all the other things that he did throughout his life. Of course, he eventually died 1891, and immediately there was a, a movement to put up a statue um, of Douglas and in Rochester, and um, uh, and that was funded uh, within the community and without. Um, you know, like the Haiti, for example, sent money, <laughs> and and the people of Haiti, you know, sent sent money, and it was a very successful successful. And for a long time, it was at the center of Rochester right by the train station. So when you would have got out of the train in Rochester immediately, there would have been the ambassador to the city, Frederick Douglass. And we still sort of see him as our own here, even though he wasn't born here and he didn't die here, he's buried here uh, <laughs> along with his family. And I'm glad to take any questions that you may have. Um, I know I was supposed to have stopped a while ago, but we hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully nobody's sleeping on me yet. I've had students sleeping on me. <laughs> they do it all the time. They shut off their cameras and take a little snooze, come back. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts? Anybody want to say something about Douglas? Uh, Ithaca was obviously also part of this broader community. There were stops in the Underground Railroad all through Ithaca. I, I got my PhD at SUNY Binghamton and as far south as, as, as um, well, I lived in Owego for a while, and I know in Owego, which is, of course, on the Susquehanna, um, 
in a week ago, there were underground railroad houses right by the river because the river itself, which is goes from the Chesapeake and cuts into this area became a kind of highway. You know, you couldn't go up the river physically in a boat because it's a river, <laughs> but, but you could walk alongside of it and get up close enough to freedom to, 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 um, to make change your life. You're welcome, Ms. Mills. No questions I'm, at all? You guys don't have any thoughts? I've got a question. Oh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just jump in first and then Joanne and then anybody else. I just, I've heard, heard the North Star newspaper mentioned for as long as I've been studying in school. And I've just got the thinking about it. What, I mean, is it more of a, of a, a way to express the ideas of uh, abolition, or was it a week? Was it a weekly? Was it sharing local news? Did it? What? Was no, it's the, an abolitionist. It's an abolitionist newspaper for sure, right? I mean, it's not a it's not a newspaper in the in the way that it provides news on a regular basis about the city of Rochester or anything like that. What it does is it provides. Um, you know, he wrote most of it but it also collects anti-slavery writings, anti-slavery news. It would have talked about the elections, would have talked about the compromise of 1850. Um, and and it, it was meant, uh, first of all, they, they required an extraordinary amount of money. Right? And so the circulation of it was both a means of disseminating information and building community. Uh, I mean, the Liberator is really the first of these. There's lots of them around. I mean, there's hundreds of abolitionist newspapers. Um, and the North Star was was Douglas's was Douglas's medium for expressing himself and for 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 making himself um, heard and read, if you will. Um, and and it, but it, it they're very very precarious ventures. And so eventually he actually has to fold the newspaper with Garrett Smith's um, Garrett Smith, where we had the photograph of. He was one of the founders of the Liberty Party. Uh, as was Myron Hawley, who was buried at Mount Hope, and Myron Hawley, Hawley, the city's named after, the town is named after, him, and Rochester native for a long time, and they were founders of the Liberty Party, which is a one, one issue party, freedom and slavery, and and so they had a newspaper, and so eventually Douglas merged it with Garrett Smith because it was hard to sustain the printing, the you know, and 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 running of the newspaper. But they were basically organs. All these newspapers were organs for the various associations and or groups that sponsored them. And they were ways of, you know, again, there's no information networks. There's no radio, newspaper, television, internet. There's nothing. <laughs> it's like a void. And so how does stuff get around? It's newspapers. Those, that's how you, ideas travel <laughs> in print. The Twitter of the day, huh? Well, yeah, and I think, you know, very important Twitter for its time. Um, you know, the Seneca Falls Convention, uh, you know, he goes there and he disseminates the information. He advertises it in the, in the newspaper. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, it's a lot of power and value to them. Uh, Kathleen Gale. Yes. Um, I just got to yesterday... Um, something from about the North Star from the North Star, an article, current. I didn't realize until I got this email yesterday that the North Star still existed. Um, the article is one year ago, Ahmad Arbery died in a very American way. So this actually, um, it, I don't know if the North Star was resurfaced or it was continuous or whatever but I got this from um, Daryl Denning who's um, a friend a Quaker from um, Elmira and he does his own Black Lives Matter um, on his own he stands out and does Black Lives Matter every every week um, even though most of us don't do that Right now he does, and he's in contact with other people. But this is very interesting to me that mm. you can be a page subscriber to the North Star now. 
Well, there you go. It continues as a as a valuable organ of of dissent and and this you know the, the quest for racial justice. Uh, yeah, I don't absolutely. you know I'm not, I've seen it online, but I'm not familiar with who who runs it. Uh, well, there you go. Indeed. Nice. And um, it, it it certainly is not affiliated. There there is a Douglas family. Um, there is a, something called the FDFI, which is the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative. Uh huh. And they were based out of uh, California for a long time, and they just moved to Rochester recently. In, in, eight, in, in, in 2018, they were involved in this project for the statues and all that stuff. I actually had them. I was the chair of the history department for a while, and they came in and gave a talk at the college to students. And it's one of the descendants of Frederick Douglass, who is still involved. Um, and so, you know, and they published his, they, they continue to publish his, his, his book. So I think the North Star is probably, it sounds like an, a, a, you know, completely separate project by another activist, as you say, Black Lives Matter activist. It's curious that you, you bring up your friend, the Quaker, who's, who's still involved. And, you know, as a, I'm not a New York person and I was born in Spain and raised in Canada and, live now in the u.s my third country <laughs> and I, I continuously trip across quakers in my work and they're a fascinating bunch and the hicksite quakers in rochester were critical to all of the abolitionist movements i mean it's across the you know lucretia mott who had a recent biography of her written by carol faulkner uh, who's a colleague of mine at binghamton we were students together and she wrote a wonderful book about lucretia mott who's a very important quaker and in, in, in Philadelphia, but Amy Kirby Post, who's a Hicksite Quaker in, in Rochester, and there's a huge community, Fairport, all over the place. And, they're, and, they're, and to, even to this day, as you mentioned, Kathleen, they're, they're still active. So tell, tell me, have you ever, have you ever visited uh, the Frederick Douglass House in Washington, D.C.? It's very interesting. And, his, and what he did, what he did as Senator, uh, Douglas did when he was senator. I would have liked to have found out more about that too. Well, he, he, he was never elected to the Senate. Well, he, elected to this, he was elected to government, wasn't he? He, he was. He was appointed to numerous positions toward the end of his life. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, and he was involved as a diplomat in Haiti and Santo Domingo and a few other places. Um, was he born in DC? Near DC? Is that what it is? Yeah, he was born in Baltimore. He was born in Baltimore, but he, he went to he went to move to D.C. because his Rochester house was was burnt quite likely in an arson. And uh -huh. that destroyed all his personal records, his correspondence. Oh, because I did visit his house in D.C. That's why I asked. Yeah, no, he eventually he moved to D.C. His his wife, his first wife, Anna Murray, passed away in 1882. They were married 44 years. And then he married his his, his um, a, a, a colleague of his. Mm. Helen Pitts Douglas, who was uh, a, a white abolitionist woman who he had known all his life, he used to visit the, the household when she was a child. She was also of a Quaker family um, in, in upstate New York, and they were a prominent abolitionist family. And they lived, so he lived there with, with Anna Douglas and with Helen Pitts Douglas in Washington, D.C., because, because of his involvement in... Um, in, in the Civil War, he was a recruiter for the Union Army. Uh, he, both his sons fought in the 54th Massachusetts Brigade. Uh -huh. He traveled around. And then eventually, he's involved in a number, a number of, yeah. of failed so business last, ventures. And he gets appointed to government. Sorry? His last home was in, uh, was in Rochester, not in Washington, D.C. No, it, was in, it was in Washington, D.C., his last home. And that's actually the, the one that the National Park Service maintains as yes. his the Frederick Douglass, the Frederick Douglass um, Memorial or, or, or mm. whatever you want to call it. Uh, but he lived there. He lived in Rochester longer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. And also he, had, he was involved with a lot of the people that were up in Petersburg, the, uh, the abolitionist movement there. Yeah. He was involved in just about everything. In, he was you very know, prolific. I know. He, he traveled extensively at a time when, when traveling was very physically difficult. I mean, we forget this, you know, I mentioned Susan B. Anthony earlier. Susan B. Anthony spent most of her life on the road, <laughs> which for a single woman was uh, already transgressive. But 
the physically challenging. She would have been on trains, canals, horseback, carriage. And same thing with Douglas. Douglas, um, it took a, you know, and this took a heavy, heavy toll on them. Although he did not have a short life by any means. It wasn't uh, truncated. No. But nevertheless, uh, and it's, it's another great, you know, I was at Brockport. I'm, I, SUNY Brockport is in town of Brockport, of course. And there's a, there's a little museum there called the Emily Knapp Museum. And I was looking through uh, some of their documents one day with a class. And I came across this African-American coal dealer. He's a, he's, he's a, and he was the first African-American graduate from the University of Rochester. <laughs> so which I was like, wow, okay, that's great. And, you know, and you look through his life and he, he, he was on the canal, you know, working in Douglas. He was new Douglas. He was involved with Douglas. And he sets up as a coal merchant, which was uh, traditionally, these were, you know, this is a dirty occupation. And, and there was, there was almost racially segregated in some ways, but he sets up as a merchant and becomes a middle-class member of, of the community in Brockport, very affluent, sets up his big house. His daughter goes to one of the traditionally African-American schools in Washington, D.C., and she did, boards uh, with the Douglases. Did Douglas also spend some time in London? He, he spent a lot of time in London. He, he yes. was in England for 18 months in 1845, in part because once he publishes his autobiography, people know that he's now an escaped slave, self-freed person, and he's, he's kind of a wanted person still. So he actually raises some money and sends it back, and they, somebody... They, they buy his freedom from his master so he can ah. travel freely right because oh, otherwise okay. that's, how he got that's what i was going to ask if how he managed to become not captured he so he, so he bought his freedom yeah they he raised the money and even before he returned from his european tour somebody had um you know deeded himself to himself um and and but then he also went back to england in 18 59 because he was fleeing he, they thought he thought he was gonna get arrested with the john brown thing <laughs> they had a warrant for him and they were coming for him and he apparently um somebody in rochester was a very tight-knit community and you know though not everybody was sympathetic to abolition there were a lot of people that were sympathetic to abolition and apparently somebody was on the train with the guy who was going to serve the warrant and as soon as he got off the train went and found said douglas you got to get out of town and he literally went to canada off to Britain for another six months. So he was in wow. Europe or Britain, uh, London, on two two different occasions. He was huge in Ireland. He was very popular in Ireland, Scotland, traveled to Scotland. Um, and um, yeah, they spent a lot of time there as well. So significant points of time. When he was tragically, when he was in England the second time in 1860, his daughter died in Rochester. She was only 10 years old. And, and she was buried um, in, a, in somebody else's plot for the moment. Um, uh, one of the abolitionist Quaker plots that, that were there. And then when, when he came back, they had her exhumed and put into, he bought a, a plot where he is today. Uh, the Douglas family plot is today. And that's where he's buried. His daughter, Anna, his wife, Anna, and, and Helen Pitts Douglas, his second wife. Did you talk yeah. about his wives? Were they active in the other? <laughs> you know, it's a it's a very um, it's a very so it's kind of a controversial subject, and and because um, Anna Douglas could not read and write, and she was relegated really with raising. I think they had five or six children, and he was relegated to raising the children and maintaining the household, which is very difficult. Uh, he often, they were often short of money and he was always sort of pushing the envelope in terms of the funding of the paper and maintaining of his household and all of that kind of stuff. She was taken from her community of free African-Americans in Baltimore to New York City, to New Bedford, to Rochester, to Lynn and then to Rochester. And so she had a kind of tough life that way in terms of community. And she was always surrounded by really powerful women that were really interested in her husband uh you know because he was this charismatic intelligent thoughtful you know and, and so he, there were these charismatic intelligent thoughtful women that would flock to him so the griffith sisters for example actually lived in their house for a long time and then there was um Ottilie 
Ising, Nassing, Ising, who was a, a journalist from Sweden or something who came and lived in the Rochester in the household as well. And the, the latest biography by David Blight of, of, of Douglas, which is a formidable book. It's a fantastic book. It's here somewhere. <laughs> he suggests that he probably had an affair with this woman. Uh, and I, I, always, I, I always tell my students, I can't imagine that. And there's no evidence to it, but it's a speculation based on their sort of continued romantic-like relationship over time. Well, he, she lived in the household. And what I say to my students is, I can't imagine how a, a man of his moral stature would have had an affair in his own household with his with his wife living in the household. That strikes me as impossible, almost. It would be really transgressive. He was a very handsome man. I'm sure a lot of women were out after him. <laughs> he was a very handsome man and he was smart as hell and he was charismatic. You know, you don't have to be handsome to be charismatic and you don't have to be charismatic to be handsome. <laughs> you don't have to be smart. He was the complete work. He was, he was all of it. And so he, all of his life. Um, and so, you know, when he married his second wife, she was a dedicated abolitionist and feminist and, and their marriage was condemned by both the African-American community and by white abolitionists. Her family never spoke to either one of them again, except her sister, but her, her parents never spoke to either one of them again. And, and they were ostracized by both communities who saw it as kind of catering to the, you know, the, one of the main tropes of the, of the pro-slavery narrative is this idea of miscegenation. If you free African Americans, you're going to have mixed race com communities and mixed race children, and they, they constantly parade this as a kind of trope, as a as a horror show. Look at the future, and they have posters of black men and white women dancing. This is the future you want. This is what you know. And so, Douglas, his whole life struggled against this this uh, you know racist characterization. And when he married Helen Phipps, Doug, Helen, Helen, um, Phipps Douglas, he said, basically, you know, I am also mixed race. He was of mixed race um, uh, um, descent. Uh, it's not clear exactly who his, who his white father was, um, but his mother was also uh, African-American, Indian, indigenous, indigenous, Virginia, Chesapeake uh, peoples. And, you know, so he said, I'm also of mixed race. And, you know, who are you, con who are you to condemn me for marrying uh, this white woman who's been my, who's my partner in life and love, you know? <laughs> and so they were okay with it. Um, but the issue of Anna Douglas is very complicated because she supported him all his life and raised his family and children and was a loyal and, and loving person. And she it seems that she got, she got a pretty raw deal in terms of, of how she was perceived at the time by his colleagues who perhaps didn't appreciate her as much as they might have because of her inability to read and write. And she was always, you know, not seen as part of their intellectual circle. And she probably herself didn't see herself that way either. Um, so it's kind of a tough, tough, tough story for Anna Douglas, I think. Though we never know, we will never know precisely what she felt in her heart or what they, what their nature of their relationship was, right? Uh, it's very challenging. Other thoughts or questions? <laughs> I just there was something that when you were talking about John Brown and and uh, Douglas um, that really struck me. And you were, uh, if I heard this correctly, you were saying that that Douglas was beginning to consider whether or not violence might be necessary in the the fight for anti racism. Um, and I, I was thinking about some people's interpretations of Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King um, with Malcolm X becoming perhaps, I wouldn't say certainly not less militant, um, but perhaps not quite as, um, I don't know what the word, well, cer certainly not as rejecting of white ally allies. Um, towards the end of his life and Martin Luther King developing a much, well, I would call it a broader class or less, I don't know if he developed it, but certainly by the end of his life, he was expressing a broader class uh, perspective. And um, I think 
again, it's very hard to know what, what terms to use because I wouldn't call it, he was radical in a sense all of his life maybe, but um, by the end, I mean, that Vietnam speech is just such a, an amazing critique of the American government. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I was just wondering whether or not, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how Douglas was viewing the role of violence in a struggle that did not seem to be moving very much um, in terms of nonviolent. <clears throat> well, you know, so, I mean, I, I think your question is a really good one. Was he, in a sense, radicalized over time or pushed into a different perspective over time as a function of his continued frustration with, with white uh, reticence to end slavery and or, you know, and slave uh, the, the racism against against black men and women, uh, and and you're right. I mean, you know, um, Martin Luther King certainly with the Poor People's March and with the, the the criticism of Vietnam was moving to a broader. It was he was getting away from the earlier church based uh, you know civil rights movement into a broader critique of American capitalism and society. And and I think you know with, with, with I don't I don't think Douglas ever rejected anything in terms of how to end slavery, right? But I think, you know, he starts out with moral suasion, which I, I'm always been skeptical of, but I have no real evidence to be skeptical of because I always think that the moral suasion camp, what could they offer black people? You know, it's, it's a sin. And so we need to, you know, educate white people to not sin anymore. But, you know, so, um, so African Americans in the community must have said, "Well, yeah, okay, that's great. It's good for white souls, but <laughs> what about black bodies, right?" And so I think I think I've always been really skeptical of the dedication of African Americans to the moral suasion camp. Although I have no evidence to to on which that's based, I just think it's illogical. So when I think when he comes back from England the first time, he's got it in his mind that moving to Rochester will bring him closer to this political camp. Right. And he, he formally breaks only after the compromise of 1850. I think it's 1851, 1852, that he starts writing editorials that say moral suasion just doesn't work, folks. We're gonna need, we need to end slavery by any means possible, to paraphrase Malcolm X. And, and, and if that means running elections, he actually supported the free soil, free speech, free men party, which was you know, Martin Van Buren's. And they were a racist party. Free soil, territory out west, easily accessible, cheap land for, for white men was their model. Free soil, free speech, no more tabling of anti-slavery petitions in Congress, and free men, free white men. <laughs> right? And so, but he supported the, the, the free soil party because he thought it was the best way to put a dent in slavery's armor. And so I think I think he was of the mind that anything that you need to do, he's, and he certainly defended himself when he, when he was attacked and he advocated self-defense when he was attacked, which was, you know, even then was an issue. Should we fight back, you know, physically or should we just get beaten and trumble? No, he advocated self-defense. Um, and, and, you know, he started working with John Brown as early as 1847. And John Brown actually lived in Rochester for a long time at his house while he was, you know, advocate, um, uh, trying to raise money. And, and so I, although he, I think he thought John Brown's plan was crazy, it was folly, it wasn't going to work. And that was the main problem. But once war started, I mean, you know, he, he voted, he, he, he promoted, the Republican Party was, of course, created in 1854 with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It it's comes out of that. And John C. Fremont in 1856 is the first Republican candidate for president. And Douglas supports him and, you know, campaigns for him. Um, um, so I think you probably think it wouldn't work, but I, I don't think he ever would have taken violence off the table. You know, anything, anything that ends this nightmare is, is what we need to do. Yeah, Kathleen, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I learned in well, I forget, Auburn Prison, they had some kind of dramatic representation of um, African American history, and the, the the play was about just what we've been talking about um, about 
Frederick Douglass, Harper's Ferry, and the play said that um, there were America, um, there were Rochester businessmen who funded, maybe four of them or something like that, who funded um, the Harper's Ferry action. But the play also said that um, even in Rochester, although I don't know why he went to Harper's Ferry then, um, Frederick Douglass did not believe in that because it was against um, it was against the union. It was against the constitution. That's what they said. But I don't know whether <laughs> it's a funny source for me to give to you. No, and no, I that's that's you know I, I I appreciate that because I think that 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 could very well be the case. I mean, you know, the constitution was a document at the center of the abolitionist debate, right? Because Garrison <laughs> said the constitution is a deal with the devil, and then. When Douglas moved his position over to the political side, he 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 made that argument by arguing that the Constitution was actually anti-slavery, right? And uh -huh. so there were a number of articles that he wrote, and he embraced a kind of political abolition based on the defense of the Constitution. So I I don't know what precisely he thought about you know Harper's Ferry in terms of you know the American government, the assault that it was on the American government, which it was. Although Robert E. Lee was the guy who, you know, put put the, the Harper's Ferry <laughs> assault down, he was he was the commanding officer and in, in the troops that came that came to 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 liberate Harper's Ferry. But you know, it's a very weird situation because, as you mentioned, he was there at Harper's Ferry the night before. Right. He, he, was, he was in a quarry, and the the young man that he took with him, that was his his assistant, his colleague in in the abolitionist struggle in Rochester stayed with John Brown. John Brown pleaded with Douglas, join us. And, and Douglas said, no, this is suicide. And, and the young man who was traveling with Douglas did stay. And I think was eventually killed yeah. in that, in that conflict. Um, you know, so it's, it's hard to say, but that's, I'd like to see that play because uh, it sounds like it was uh, uh, insightful. The, the, the people who funded Brown are traditionally called the secret six. And Garrett Smith is one of them. And then there's a bunch of New England transcendentalists and sort of philosophers and ministers, right? And, and it's not clear, you know, to what extent they were completely aware of everything and how, how it all shook out. Because again, it's not, it's not like you have your cell phone and you can call and, people and say, hey, we're about to go. So he was fundraising throughout New England and New York, traveling. That's why he was in Douglas's house for a while. And went west to Buffalo and raised some more money, Ohio, and 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 eventually, you know, Harriet Tubman was also on his recruiting team and recruited people for him and money for him, for John Brown, and and so, you know, the Secret Six is what that that group is often referred to as, um, and the, you know, they were white abolitionists who saw in John Brown a way to ignite uh, rebellion and, and end the institution. And of course, we're, we're wrong, more or less. Um, and again, many of them fled, had to go underground for a little while. Garrett Smith was institutionalized for a while. Uh, I think he, he sort of either feigned mental illness or perhaps had a nervous breakdown as a result of all of this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, that's how they managed to break that away. But that sounds like a great play. And Auburn Prison would be somewhere to, to watch. Well, play. very yeah. ironic, don't you think? It was enacted by prisoners. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, had a, I had a student who worked at Auburn once. He was a prison guard. I, I taught at Cuca College for a while, which is down near you guys. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and I had a student who was a prison guard at Auburn, and he had some really interesting things to show me, and he had some narratives by the by the by the prisoners. Um, it's a it's an interesting story, the whole Auburn thing. The same guys that built the Rochester Aqueduct were originally the the ones that designed and built Auburn. The uh, first Auburn. 
the first Auburn, yeah. And and with the old historic and, and it's it's stonemasons and it's it was all about engineering, stonemasonry, you know, building huge structures. And and the original contractor who was a designer and superintendent of the Auburn prison came to Rochester to build the, the aqueduct. And then I think he died in the process somehow. And 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 uh, the job was taken over by somebody else. But at first they they actually used Auburn prisoners in the construction of the aqueduct. Um, and some of them escaped and there was a scandal. And <laughs> but prison, that, that, Auburn was very innovative in many ways, including prison labor, which was subcontracted out as it is today um, um, uh, for, to, to diminish the cost of, of incarceration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? We... Thank you for this opportunity. It's uh, it's great to communicate with, with folks other than my students. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I have one more question. Okay, go ahead, Leslie. Uh, you're, not, you're not using pocket sites, are you, for your tours? Pocket sites, I don't know what that is. That, that okay, it, it's what our history center and uh, Cornell and a number of other things in Ithaca are using. So it's, a, it's another way of doing what you're doing with your barcodes. So it's called pocket sites. And you go on a tour and it calls up either video or, uh, sorry, audio or text for you to read as you stop at each site. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, in, in the last five years, there's been an explosion of this stuff. There's, there's another mm -hmm. app called Albany Then and Now, which is also like a phone app. And you're, if you're in Albany, you can tour around and they show you the buildings in both. And it's a photograph. You can slide with your finger. And you can see the building looked like in 1850 what it looks like now is so there's yeah. a lot of these around but I'm, i appreciate that because um yeah I've got so if you're ever in Ithaca and you get it you can do the ame zion tour and you can do the cornell tour and the and the lbgt tour so there's there's a number of pocket sites available in the Ithaca area if you come over this way i'll check it out uh, hopefully once once we're all out of this quarantine status <laughs> Maybe I've been closeted here for 18 months at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, thank you so much for making the time and, and a really interesting presentation, really covered a lot of interesting details. And, um, and everybody that attended, it's great to see you all. Thanks for showing up. But uh, um, I'll be in touch. I got to go, go back to re refer back to what you said about some people that would be uh, willing to do such, you know, similar thing. Um, but uh, in the uh, meantime, because I said they'd be willing to do it doesn't mean they're willing to do it. <laughs> no, they're signed up. <laughs> yeah. So you have to, you, you're going to have to coerce them in your own way. <laughs> okay. And I, well, and I would look up Sarah Albert if, you know, if I, um, I haven't talked to her in a long, long time, but she was a great Ithaca character. And uh, I will, I'll drop your name as, as a, the, where I got her name from, but um, I won't go beyond that. So thank you and thank you all and have a thank good you. afternoon. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.